Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. For more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. And now, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Genesis. Tonight is study number 13 in Genesis chapter 32, and we'll begin reading in verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. And I'll stop reading there, and that brings us to the uh, end of the chapter. Now, going back to verse 30, uh, once again it says, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, Peniel, and and that's the same word as Penuel. Uh, Don't ask me why the translators spelled it differently, but they did. And it's Strong's number 64, 39, and it it means seeing God's face. And and that's what Jacob goes on to say, uh, writing under the inspiration of God in the second part of verse 30. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Jacob uh, says that uh, he has seen God face to face, and his life has been preserved. And the word preserved means delivered. And um, if we get time in this study or the next, we'll take a look at that word and how it's used in a few places. And it does have to do with salvation. And and, and so we can understand his statement regarding seeing God face to face because the Bible tells us some very serious things concerning seeing God's face as we read in Exodus chapter 33. It says in verse 20, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And Jehovah said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. In these verses, we, we have a couple of statements Regarding God's face, thou cannot see my face and live. And also, um, he places Moses in a cliff of the rock, and he covers him with his hand while he passes by in order that his back parts be seen, but my face shall not be seen. And yet, in the very same chapter, if we uh, read a little earlier, it says in starting in verse 9 and it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and Jehovah talked with Moses and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door and Jehovah spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. This is the same Hebrew word that's translated as face in verses 20 and 23. Jehovah spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. You see the complexities of the Bible and uh, its critics would would say the errors, the inconsistencies, the contradictions. 
But it, none of that is true. It's not an error and, uh, nor a contradiction. It is faithful and true. Both statements are correct. And the job of the reader, of the student of the Bible, is to study to harmonize. How can they both be correct? How can Moses have spoken face to face with God as a man speaketh unto his friend, and the very same Moses, just a few verses later, be told, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And then God goes to a great lengths to make sure Moses does not see his face by putting him in the cleft of the rock and covering him with his hand and and just showing him his back parts. What is the solution? Well, the solution comes when we understand the words or the phrase face to face has a spiritual meaning. It has a spiritual meaning. It, it has a biblical definition that we find when we search the rest of the Bible. And uh, this is important to us because Jacob has just seen God's face. But Jacob didn't die. He didn't die. And and um, it, uh, he, he says his life is preserved. We can, again, understand why he would say that, given this information that was not yet written down, but but the word of God would have been verbally handed down in the generations, and 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 certainly the awesome nature of God, uh, His great terribleness, and the fact that man cannot see God would have been part of that information. And here Jacob is uh, delighted that he has seen God face to face. And, and he calls the place Penuel because of it, and his life is preserved. He did not die. But, but we read in other scriptures, like Psalm 34, it says in verse 16, The face of Jehovah is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And also... In Psalm 68, it says in verse 2, As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. And the English word presence is uh, it's a translation of that same Hebrew word face. It, it's often translated presence. So let the wicked perish at the face of God. And uh, it's the same thing in the New Testament. If we go to Revelation chapter 6, verses uh, 16 and 17, it says, and, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And I think after reading that passage in Exodus where God placed him in the cliff of the rocks and covered him in order that he did not see his face, but only his back parts, that this has some relationship here, um, saying to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, that as the Lord Jesus Christ Eternal God is seated on the judgment throne in the day of judgment. And so hide us from, from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Which means in judgment day, God is making his face known. He's revealing his face and the wicked will perish at the presence of God, at the face of God. And, and again, that happens in Judgment Day, and we are presently in Judgment Day. And, and therefore, God has been revealing his face. We could gather just 
from this information because uh, it is a part of Judgment Day. We're living uh, this day on the earth in the day of the wrath of God, and God has revealed his face and the wicked in a spiritual way. Uh, it, it is as though they are calling to mountains and rocks to fall on them and hide them from the face, from the presence of God that is seated upon the judgment throne. And this language actually does tie right in with Revelation chapter 20, Revelation 20 and verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. See, the, now we understand the reference to the face. It, it's the face of God. The wicked perish at his face. No man shall see his face and live, except for Moses and Jacob. And we could gather all God's elect, but but again, it, there is still some, uh, yes, we understand that the elect will not perish because their sins are paid for, and that will permit them to come into the presence of God for all eternity. Once this world is destroyed, we will, we will dwell with God, or, or more accurately, he will dwell with us and be with us and never leave us. And, and the Bible tells us in Revelation 22 about this um, glorious eternal future in verses 3 and 4, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. They shall see his face. The, the elect children of God will see God's face. And this eternal state that all the saved individuals of, uh, brought out of this world will, will be blessed with and enjoy forevermore, will be dwelling in the fullness of the presence of God. The fullness of presence, as it says in Psalm 16, in Psalm 16 and verse 11, Thou will show me the path of life in thy presence, and that's that same word, face, in thy face is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And, 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 and so... That's clear. That's clear that that it's only necessary for God to hide his face from his people while uh, this world still exists, because we're we're still in sinful bodies. We're we're in bodies uh, that are seeing corruption, that uh, that have the working of sin in them. And God is holy God, holy God. So we we cannot enter into fullness of his presence or we would die. We would die. That It's uh, a protection for us while we live in these uh, cursed bodies that are still in sin. It, it would be um, bringing sin to the presence of God, and that cannot be. And and so God protected Moses. He he hid him in the cliff of the rocks and only showed his back parts. Okay, all right, that makes sense. But what's still not answered is why did did it say earlier in Exodus chapter thirty three that God spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaketh with his friend? And again, the answer is that it does not mean um, in, in the fullness of God's presence that, that Moses um, had, a, had a, an encounter with Jehovah God. He didn't come into the fullness of his presence, 
but that is language describing something else. And and when we search the Bible, we discover what is being described. Uh, for example, if we turn to Second John, Second John, the second epistle of John, and we read in verse twelve, having many things to write unto you. I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. You know, there's a reference to fullness of joy, isn't there? And and that's because um, John, who's likened to the elder here as the epistle begins in, in the first verse, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. And so John the elder is a picture of God, the ancient of days, who is, of course, the elder, isn't he? He is older than all because he's from everlasting. And and as John is writing unto the elect lady and her children, God has written the Bible to his elect, or we could say to Abraham and his seed, or to Christ and his seed. It is using John as a type and figure of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, addressing the elect, and therefore, verse 12 again, having many things to write unto you. God is saying to his elect people, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. And remember how the parable of the prodigal son or the lost coin or the the lost sheep where we were told when it is found that there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. And, and, and so there is joy in God's salvation. And the fullness of joy would have to do with all those that God has saved becoming saved. And, and that would be a fullness of joy from God's perspective. And then we enter into his very presence, which is fullness of joy for us. And, and from our perspective, as the people of God, but but here is really a reference to what God has done as he's written the Bible. He's completed the written word, and he did that way back uh, by the close of the first century A.D. Estimates are about 95 A.D. Uh, the Lord moved John to write the book of Revelation, and that completed the whole book. It was in progress from Moses all the way to John, about 1,500 years, God moved within men of old, holy men of old, to write down the things that he would have them to write because it was the word of God from the mouth of God. And yet God has more to say, didn't he? More information. But once the Bible was complete, he obligated himself. He he placed himself under uh, the law of Revelation twenty two eighteen, which says, "Whoever adds to the words of this book, God will add the plagues written thereof to that individual." And and so there cannot be anything additional in writing after the book of Revelation. There, there cannot be any additional dream or vision or tongue given to anyone either, because if it were, that should be written down, just as Isaiah wrote the vision that God gave him, or just as other prophets wrote the dreams and so forth that God gave them. Any uh, supernatural revelation cannot be added to the Bible. Well, that presents a problem because this verse indicates that that God, Christ, will come 
and speak face to face to the elect in order that their joy be full. And yes, it does tie in with the word sealed till the time of the end. And it's at the time of the end, it is unsealed and knowledge increases and it's it's uh, happening simultaneously with the sending forth of the latter rain wherein God saves the great multitude and completes his salvation program by saving everyone who he had intended to save. And, and that would bring this fullness of joy concerning the repentance of all the elect that were chosen to receive God's grace and mercy. And, uh, you know, we, we read similar things in John 16. If we go over to John 16, where it says in verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. And this is the Lord Jesus who's speaking. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. Uh, most theologians, probably all, uh, practically all, uh, they, they mistake uh, this reference to the Spirit's coming to what happens just, just a little while later on the day of Pentecost in 33 AD. And they assume the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is what has guided the people of God into all truth, but we know that's not correct because the Bible indicates that the churches had partial understanding. They saw through a glass darkly over the course of the entire church age for 1955 years. But you see, there is a second outpouring of the Holy Spirit that the Lord would accomplish in the Jubilee year of 1994. And when John 16, 13 tells us, howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, it is not specific concerning which coming of the spirit. Is it the first outpouring of the spirit in, in Pentecost or the second outpouring of the spirit in the Jubilee year of 1994? And given that it says that when the Spirit is come, he will guide you into all truth. It must be the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit starting in September of 1994. And, and just uh, look at what has happened since then. With all the uh, wonderful uh, doctrine that the Lord has brought forth from his word, concerning the faith of Christ, the Sunday Sabbath, baptism, the washing away of sin, the end of the church age, the, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that there is no place of eternal hell and torment uh, uh, forever and ever, but, but hell is a condition and, and there is a temporal place on the earth that is turned into hell over the course of a prolonged judgment day period. And May 21, Judgment Day, it's a spiritual judgment on the world. That's shocking. That's shocking. Nobody had ever known that. And uh, the prolonged nature of the Judgment Day, more information. The elect would be left on the earth to go through it. God's delay in drawing of the elect after saving them. And, and a period of time, Judgment Day, wherein no one is being saved anywhere in the world or church or, or anywhere else. It, all these things just keep coming forth out of the Bible. More and more information, and, and it's truth. It's truth. Never previously known. It is progressive revelation. It is the information sealed till the time of the end. And, and this is what Christ had in mind. When again in verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but 
ye cannot bear them now. Of course not. Of course the Holy Spirit poured out in 33 AD would not uh, reveal to the church its end all the way in the 20th century when, when the church had a task to perform throughout those centuries. And it would, it would be an unnecessary burden to weigh down the church and, and, and even to, to have the knowledge, well, uh, the world will continue for all these centuries and, and, and for a couple of thousand years almost. But, and, and, you know, it's, it's always, um, been in, in, uh, in past history of the church age that as people experience troubles and afflictions and, and tribulations and persecutions, sometimes, uh, uh gravely severe unto death, physical death, that, that God wrote the Bible in such the, in such a way with those verses, uh, no man knows a day or hour, so that practically every generation could have an expectation and therefore a hope of some kind, maybe Christ will come. Maybe it'll be now in the second century or the eighth century or the 15th century. And we look back and, you know, people always like to say, well, people have been saying Christ is coming for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and yes, because God actually allowed for that understanding to develop because it, it serves as a sort of release valve on pressure. Oh Lord, come quickly, come quickly. And, and, and God knew the time. He knew when the Lord would come and it would be uh, again, almost 2000 years, but it was not necessary to weigh down the saints of the past with that knowledge. No, the Lord uh, stored it up till the time of the end. And then he reveals the time is near and, and the timeline of history and the timeline for the great tribulation and the time, the beginning day of judgment, May 21, 2011, because it, it's necessary for the saints living at the time of the end to possess that information. It, it's, it's not unneedful, but very, very needful for them. And, and so God has arranged things in this way to open up the information at the end of the world. And in doing so, as we read in, in third John, it will produce the effect. Oh, I'm sorry. That was, that was second John and second John 12, having many things to write unto you. I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Thank you for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. For more studies and information, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. Until our next Bible study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.